Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Alonzo, I wanted to ask you a, a question. You've talked a lot um, today about accelerating learning, more data, more testing. Um, I think in your testimony you said uh, it, all of this must be significantly enhanced. So I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea from you what that means exactly in terms of where we are today and what is significant enhancement in your mind. Let me take a little detour. If if you accept that drones today have one accident in every thousand flights, that means you must observe a thousand flights before you see a single accident. Obviously, you don't want to see just one accident. You want to see tons of accidents where there's no consequence. That means instead of a thousand flights, you have to look at tens or hundreds of thousands of flights and data points. This is the point I was trying to make in my testimony. So when I say significantly enhanced uh, to your question, I, I mean that we cannot have pilot programs that have four participants. Right, doing two or three flights a month or something. We have to have hundreds of participants doing hundreds of flights a month and accumulate that data over a significant period of time. And is that where we are today? Um, I, I think we are in a very, very small scale. Very these, small scale. There are excellent flight test programs, and I, I give kudos to both Congress and to the FAA for starting them, but I think we need to, quote, unquote, significantly enhance them. And then to compare what we are doing today to where uh, others in Japan or Switzerland, uh, other international communities where you've expressed concern that we may be falling mm -hmm. behind in terms of R&D? So I, I think they're, they're starting, but they're not significantly ahead of us. There are some simpler regulatory environments, but I, I like to make the analogy more to driverless cars. You know, when you look at the amount of testing that is actually being done to figure out when and how these cars should be allowed to go on the roads. We're talking of about millions of hours of driving accumulated by a number of different companies. I, I think we need to go in autonomous drones in a very similar direction. Thank you. And um, this is a question more for anybody really on the panel. And I'm a, a little new in my learning around this issue. So, um, but. There have been, you've uh, previously talked about issues and our concerns around privacy, security, et cetera. Um, and I think Mr. Ball or Ms. Dr. Alonzo, I'm not sure, responded by saying, well, we could, we could start to learn more by simply flying in unpopulated areas. Um, so I'm having a hard time understanding what we learn flying uh, drones in an unpopulated area. It just, it seems like, well, there is no safety issue necessarily. I mean, you're out in the open space. So if you could enlighten me. Well, I, I, think, I think what uh, was being discussed was part, part of the learning is, to Dr. Alonzo's point, is uh, when you do have an accident, or when, when there's a, uh, a failure of a piece of equipment, how does the equipment react to it? What, what do you see? And if, if, if you have a failure, like Mr. Woodall just said, in the middle of a field in, in Georgia, that's unfortunate. We don't like that. But we can learn from it, and then that can be a, you can take those learnings and then say, okay, if that had happened in, Was in the Washington, D.C. area, you know, how, what would the impact have, have been? So it's, it's, uh, it's just something as simple as, as that, I believe. Well, it seems to me that there are so many different types of uh, UASs. I mean, there, you know, there's lots of manufacturers. I guess you could group them into certain categories, but it seems like that's an inordinate amount of data points that I'm not sure you can, you know, uh, draw a line between them. Well, take, take for comparison the commercial aviation system. It, it's got similar diversity, and the failures can be equipment, although they're very, very rare, but it can be operations, and normally it's a combination of effects that lead to a particular failure. Uh, we have over a million drones, right, uh, in the U.S. right now. We could uh, expand the way in which we collect data as to when these things fail, or where they almost fail, um, in a much more large-scale way. I think this is the main point. And, and yes, there will be a lot of data, but it's the best hope we have to actually impose logical regulations. So is there another example of where we would, what we would learn um, flying in unpopulated areas, Mr. Goodwin? 
Yeah, I'll offer very briefly an example that I think touches upon uh, what Mr. Woodall said. Uh, the number of stakeholders that you have to be concerned about when it comes to privacy and security are significantly fewer in relatively low density areas. So it's easier to get them into a room, it's easier to talk to a handful of folks and find a technology means of addressing their solution than it would be, say, in an urban environment. Um, so I think that the just from a simple crawl, walk, run kind of approach, a lot of those learnings are going to be applicable because candidly a lot of folks that we've encountered in some of the more rural environments do have strong sense of private property and concerns about privacy and they'd be more than happy to participate in the benefits of technology so long as their concerns are addressed so it's the right population to really try to get those learnings on simply because of the scale and the scale relative to the scale of the commercial opportunity which is significant uh, thank you and thank you mr chairman i yield back um mr duncan well thank you very much mr chairman uh, Dr. Alonzo, uh, you serve on the key 